Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome, thank you for coming. And uh, I really hope you find it helpful. I had an absolutely uh, wonderful time the last few, the last few uh, Q and A's. This is the third in a series. Um, I'm gonna send you an email for some feedback and then Emir uh, Sashem, perhaps we'll be able to do this on a regular basis after Yom Tif. I'm extraordinarily impressed that um, that uh, you made the time before Yom Tif to, um, to participate, to learn about parenting, to grow together. Um, I, I really found, I myself, as, as you saw in real time, I myself learned a lot from, from um, our session last week, as I always do. Um, I, I just, just a few random thoughts to start with. Uh, first of all, you know, there, I, I wanna talk about the, the, the long-term and the short-term memory. And, you know, one of the things that we're all looking to do is build a, a memory base in our children. Um, um, remembering the lessons that they learned in our house uh, and, and all the like. Um, you know, uh, very often um, it's not the things that we say, but much more what they see and what they observe that people tend to remember. Um, and I think it's really important because <clears throat> often we struggle with, you know, what should we say to make the moment uh, a memorable or what are, are we saying the right things? Are we, it's really, the children remember um, the long-term memory is much more about, about a feeling, about, um, about what they observe. I, I think that's just important to note. And it's also the participation. Um, one of my rabbeim, I do not remember which rabbi it was, or I'll quote him by name, but one of my rabbeim said something. He said it as a, like almost as a, as a one-off, as a casual comment, but for some reason it stuck in me, you know, 50 years later. <clears throat> and he said that if you look um, among the, the wide spectrum of the Jewish population, people, you know, the different uh, denominations, whether people are, are religiously observant or that uh, or that not that religiously observant all year round, Pesach seems to have really made it, right? That virtually all families participate in in some in some way um, in Pesach. Uh, the vast majority of Jewish families have a seder, and if you look, for example, this is my Rebbe said it was a chassidish Rebbe of mine, um, and if you look at Sukkot it's not as universally observed um, in the broader Jewish population. And my Rebbe said that, that um, throughout the generations, Pesach was something that the entire family participated in. And everybody felt like a sense of ownership. And um, we did things together. We, 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 whereas Sukkot, especially in many of the communities in, in Europe where, where where um, it was freezing cold during Sukkot and um, Sukkot would more, tend, tended to be smaller. And usually just the men went out and the women stayed in the house. And there wasn't that sense of, of uh, working together and, and it being more of a joint effort. That's what my Rebbe said, it's just a, something interesting to, um, to, to reflect upon, uh, to try to make our, our Yom Tov, we were just talking about Shabbos meals, <clears throat> the upcoming Pesach, something meaningful and to, to join together. Um, and and it, it's not necessarily about only, you know, the, the important parts, the very tired of all of these parts are very important, uh, but the children tend to remember being together and, and, and participating in this. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the, the two outstanding things from last week that we, we kept uh, looping around um, were, were the, was the point of the Svasemis, and I saw it resonated with, with many of you, and I got quite a few emails uh, from, from our, our Hever, from our group, um, either for clarification or just thanking me for bringing up this point. And the two major points that we discussed, and uh, I'm going to turn it over uh, for Q and A, uh, as soon as I'm finished going over this, um, and if you don't have any questions, I'll go to some of the ones that were submitted. But the two big things that we talked about last week were was the concept of 
we, we spoke about the Svasemis, and, and the Svasemis, one of the Ger Rebbe's spoke about, I'm not going to go into the details of the Dvar Torah. You can look that up uh, in, in, you know, in the session, uh, previous last week's session is up on YouTube. But the big idea was that the, the Svasemis spoke about, about the fact that we have a goal, the fact that we have a, a, something to shoot for, something to strive for, uh, but we're, it's important to strive for excellence, but insisting on excellence or even expecting excellence, either from ourselves, certainly from children, especially younger children or adolescents, <clears throat> is, is not workable. And the biggest proof, he says, uh, again, uh, you do the details of the Vatara, he says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu also thought that the world would work with me, the Sadin, that the world would, would operate with a certain sense uh, uh, of structure. And um, Hashem saw that because there are people, you know, it, it won't work this way. And Hashem went to a, a mixture of Rachamim and Din. And I think it's important for us as we plan for our lives and we plan, in this case, we were discussing Shabbos tables or other expectations we have of our children, um, to understand that when we make accommodations for our very human children, it's not that we're lowering our standards. Our standards stay the way they are. It's just that we're adjusting for the reality of the way things are in the real world. Second point um, that, that I, I'd like to uh, uh, refresh our memory about was this concept of, of Rav Dessler, uh, speaking at Mecht Melio about the, the, the concept of the Kudas Abechira. And the big idea is that we gave an analogy with sports, an analogy with war. I'll add another analogy, you know, football. Uh, we spoke about soccer yes, last week, but the concept is that you have a very big football field, but the actual line of scrimmage, the place where the action is, is only one small piece of that. And what Rav Dessler was explaining and, and again, it was a philosophical, it was a hashkafa issue, but it's very, very relevant to our parenting concept. And what Rav Dessler was explaining is that, um, that every person has their nukuda sabachira. And the nukuda means is that point uh, in the continuum of all the mitzvah observance and all the things that we try to work on, um, our empathy and our kindness and sharing and not losing our temper and giving tzedakah and setting aside time for davening and for learning, all of those things on a continuum where we have one place where we are. And, and that's what's within the range of which mitzvahs we're going to do. And chas v'shalom, which Averis were tempted by. He calls that an akudas habechira. Rav Deslo says that one of our, our jobs in life, so to speak, is to move that nakudas habechira in an upward way. But what's really important for parents is to, to get your hands around where the Nakuta Sabahira of your children are and how important that is to, to understand where your children are at any given time. The example that we would the extrapolate from that is that, um, again, going with, with Rav Desla's example, if we were to, uh, to give children either constructive criticism or discuss with them things that are vastly above or below their Nakuda Sabahira, um, either making demands on them or asking them to do things that are way beyond what they have the capacity to do. Um, let's say for some, you know, sitting at a Shabbos table for three hours, okay? Or, or, um, or anything else that we may ask them to do that's not where they are right now, or, you know, asking them for things that are way below the Nakudus Abachira. In other words, uh, whether it would be accusing them of things or thinking that they would do things. The most important thing to know is to really know your kids. The only way you can do that, and this is what we've been working on all three weeks and, and the previous classes that I gave during the summer, is the only way you could really know where your children's where they are in life is if they seek your guidance. The only way they seek your guidance is if you have a real relationship with them. And that's where that's all about. And that winds up going into these goals that we were talking about. Okay, so I did have a, a specific question regarding benching, some other things that were 
in the general parenting arena. Uh, but for now, anybody can unmute themselves if you'd like to, to ask any question or make any comment about what we spoke about. Before we go on to some other things, I'll be delighted to take them now. Please, no structure, no format. Feel free to unmute yourself. If two of you do it at the same time, then we'll just, <laughs> one of you will defer to the other, I guess. Anyone, please, anybody have any questions? Okay, I'll wait a moment or two, anybody? Feel free to, oh, I'll have a chat. Uh, your chat feature is enabled, so uh, <laughs> thank you. I complimented everyone on coming the day before, so, uh, excuse me, the week of, of Pesach, so someone wrote it's an escape from scraping and scrubbing. It's very good. Um, okay, and that's also, by the way, that's an akudas of Akhir to know for yourself. You know, the Rabbanim, um, last year, um, many Rabbanim issued very clear guidelines that we should diminish, uh, scale down the amount of work we're doing at home because things were so stressful at home. I, I think everyone should really be making their own cheshman and nefesh, their own understanding of where their own nekudas of where your own reality is, um, so that you can adjust according to, um, you know, according to where you are in, where you are at any particular time. So again, you can use the chat. Um, I'll wait just another moment and then I'll get on to a question um, that we, we actually ended with. We didn't have enough time for last week. Okay, anyone? Four, three, two, one. Okay. So I'm going to go. One last thing. You have a feature there that you can um, you can uh, wave your hand. So if you want to click on that, I'll be glad to to acknowledge you. So so one of the parents yesterday had a, uh, last week had a question, and the 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 father emailed me today a, a question about about benching overall, because one of the things that we talked about was the notion of having. Um, <clears throat> a set of goals and expectations for the children, for, for our family. And, um, and what I said was that usually the main thing that you want, what's most important, you will almost always get from the people around you. In other words, if, if I gave an example, let's say if a parent says that we have, you know, these five minutes or 10 minutes that we all, we'd like everybody at the table. The rest of the time you can excuse yourself. Or if a parent uh, says, we want everybody here for the first one of Azmir's, the first songs we'd like to sing together. So whatever it is that you choose and, and you make that your top priority, I was saying that you're in all likelihood, you'll get that. So someone asked about the concept of benching and that one of the, that, that one or more of their children are having a difficult, a difficult time with the benching. Um, and, and how to do it if some children uh, refuse to bench or, or uh, bench is, is brachas amazan, is, is uh, um, the brachas that we say after, after we finish eating. So I, I had a very interesting discussion with Rav Shmuel Kamenetsky Shlita, who's been our Paisik and Project guest for many years. And um, the subject of davening uh, came in, in the discussion. And um, uh, Rav, Shmuel, Rav Shmuel said um, that, the, that the, the first thing that parents should uh, stress if they have children that are struggling with the concept of davening or the concept of benching, um, Rav Shmuel, just as a practical etza, he said that the easiest way to, to inculcate children into making a, a benching and, and davening as part of their lives is to start with uh, which are another way of saying brachas uh, that say thank you instead of please. You know, many of the things that we, we, we say are tefillos, we're davening for Yerushalayim, we daven for Yishman Esrei for different things. But the, the brachas that we say in the morning um, about about gifts that Hashem gave us that we're able to see and that we're able to, to that those, those are gifts of thanks to Hashem. And the brachas that we give for food, that, that's a thank you for what we've experienced, that we're, we're fortunate enough to have food to eat. So those are things that should be for parents who are having difficulty with getting their children into davening. The first, the easiest focus, the first focus should be um, the 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 brachas that thank Hashem for food in advance or brachas amazon, 
uh, the benching where that comes after the meal. Now, um, I think what I just want to point out another thing to this parent who said that their children are having a very difficult time with it. Um, it the, I've always felt as a, as a Rebbe and as a principal of yeshiva for many years, um, I've always felt very strongly about this, that uh, whenever I told the children a halacha, Jewish law, I was always very clear to say whether this is a halacha, which is a ruling that things that we, we are obligated to do, um, what's considered a minhag, which is a custom, uh, what's considered a chumrah, a chumrah is something that you take an additional stringency upon yourself, and what is just common practice. I think it's really important for parents and, and educators to explain this to children as you're teaching it to them. And again, as we mentioned yesterday, um, uh, last week, excuse me, it, it doesn't mean that we're diminishing what we're teaching them. It just means that, that we're just explaining it as is. So for example, in the case of benching, um, now you as a parent have to decide if you wanna say it this way, because you, know, you might have to live with the, 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 re, the, you know, the corollary afterwards, but I think it's valuable to tell children who are experiencing difficulty with benching to say that in the Torah it says, you should eat, you become full, and then you bench Hashem. And that min ha the, the actual obligation, a person it fulfills that obligation by, by, by saying even the first uh, bracha of benching, or, uh, you know, or, or even thanking Hashem in the vernacular. So I, I think it's important to, to meet people where they are. If you see you have a child, for example, that, that doesn't understand Hebrew, um, that just find, that has an attention span difficulty and finds um, you know, a long uh, a seven minute benching to be, to be too much, to tell them to at least say the first bracha, um, maybe sing it together as a family, only the first bracha. But I, I think it's important to be able to give it to the children in, in bite-sized pieces. In other words, explain to them that, of course, we should be benching all of it, but the Torah obligates us to thank Hashem, and that can even be done with, with a, a smaller amount. Um, the, the, the issue, um, uh, anybody have a question, please? Again, you can, you can chat, you can type a chat, or you can... Um, unmute yourself or I'll just go on to some of the others that I received. Anyone folks? Okay. Um, so again, feel free, even while I'm talking, if you want to chat, if you want to, um, you can type a chat at any time. I'll, I'll stop from time to time to, to, to take questions. Um, one of the things that we spoke about last week is, is the, the concept of adolescent development. Um, and I, I sent an email, um, I sent it a little late, but I, I did send it to you today, early, to today earlier today, um, about, about the, the concept of, of adolescent development and how that works. Um, and um, the, the, oh, I'm sorry, one sec, just a moment, please. Let me just stop for a second. It says that you cannot unmute yourself. Just a moment, please. All right, let me, let me just, I'm sorry, just give me a second. Allow participants to unmute themselves. Okay, folks, can you unmute yourself, please? Can somebody check? Yeah, it works now. Okay, great, so again, everybody mute yourselves, please, one at a time if okay. you'd like to say something. Do you have a question, please? Go ahead. Yes, I have a question. Um, yes. On what you said about the benching, I was the one who wrote in the question. Yes. Um, so what happens if you give the one child bite-sized chunks? Not necessarily benching, I just used benching as an example. And then another child becomes resentful that they have to do more. You're right, right. You mean you're saying if you say, well, you you uh, you can only say if you're finding it difficult to bench, say just the first bracha of bench. Yeah. Are you saying? Yeah. You make, yeah. And then the other child says, well, why well, do I have to do right. all of it? You make accommodations for one. Uh, what happens if the other children chime in and they say, hey, <laughs> I'd like one of that, right? Yeah. Exactly. Right, so that's that's an inherent risk that you have when you become flexible, 
Um, and you, you explain to children that this is, you know, the way this is, your yotze, um, it's better, of course, and you should, and not only that, you're obligated to say all of benching, but if, you, if that doesn't work for you right now, you could just say the first, let's say the first bracha of benching, and we'll sing that together, and, and, and afterwards, if somebody can't do it, uh, we understand. So that it's true that you do run the risk that, other, that the children might. Um, other children might pick up on that or they might be resentful. And you, know, you can decide how you wanna handle that. One way to handle it, there is no right or wrong. You know, again, it depends on the culture of your family. It depends on, on how, um, how things are generally running. If there is, is, are there any stressors that you have in your life at any given time? That, that all impacts, you know, if the kids, chas um, if somebody in the extended family or the family is ill with COVID or something else is going on, or one of the family members just lost a job and everything is tense, that's probably is not the best time to start, you know, insisting on, 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 on you know, rule of law. Uh, but it is a time to be more flexible. But all other things being equal, usually people like, uh, you know, people like to do what they're supposed to do. Now, if, if they find that they want to take advantage of that, then you're probably best off saying, look, just like I said, I would love for you to bench all of it. If this is what you feel, you have to stop. You know, you can give them an example, like let's say fasting on a, on, you know, on a fast day that's not Yom Kippur. Or, or, or Tisha B'Av, if someone finds it very difficult, we make an exception. So you can explain it that way. And it, it's true, some of, some of the other children might find it, um, might wanna take advantage of that, but that's a risk you run. The other way is, you, you know, plan B there. The other way to do it is say, no, you have to bench everything and you must do it. And if you don't do it, you're not, it's, it's like you're not benching at all, right? And you say something, then you're running the risk of having of having the children just opt out altogether. So, so and uh, sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 I, please, please. I understand please, 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 that, and it's basically our approach that we've taken. But I do find that some of our other children are very resentful. So, so perhaps some, that's what I'm saying. So that, then again, then if you if you um, if they are resentful, then perhaps leave it up to their discretion also. Okay. I Meaning they're resentful if you say, okay, you only have to bench one stanza, you know, the first bracha of bench yeah. or two brachas, and then you're excused, but everybody else, you have to stay the whole time. Whereas perhaps you should say, you could think about saying, listen, we would like you all to bench everything. Whoever feels they can't do all of it, consider stopping then. This is what we would like you to do. They're less likely to be resentful. Now, again, yeah, I, I can't, um, by, by its very nature, we have, we have, like the Svasema said, right? There's a plan and then there's the reality. So you have to know your own family and know your own children and, and uh, what's their attitude to religion overall. Um, like I said, are there other stressors? So again, if everything is working well, there's no reason that, that, you should resort to that, but the reality is, yeah, you you have to you have to you know you have to deal with the with what you're do whatever you're doing at that time. Um, another point overall is that the children don't know what they're saying. Okay, uh, many times. Yeah. So, do your children know the what the words mean? I mean, they do, but I. I think maybe if they break it down word by word, they would understand their Hebrew was on a very good level. It's not so good anymore, but okay. I think more or less they understand if they think about it, but you know, they're probably just trying to get it over and done with. Okay, so I'm saying, so so you might want to say, let's say you might want to say that, you know what, um, <clears throat> the way we're benching regularly takes a minute and a half. Why don't we take a minute and a half and concentrate on one bracha? and take it apart and explain it and we'll do a different one next week let's say for example okay you make it as an edge as an experience that we're doing together does anyone remember um what this means i mean let's so so again be a little bit creative yeah. your objective is to get the children to want to do this how you get there there are a lot of paths to that 
So if you have children that are resentful about benching a, a long period of time, um, then you think, think about one of those options. Maybe, okay. um, you know, I, I was in a, an alternative high school. Um, again, that principal of the school knew the Nakuda Sabahira of his students. He knew that they were all, many of them were really <laughs> not really into uh, a davening or, or in the first place. And he actually had a, a, a phenomenal program where he divided up, again, I would not recommend this to an average mainstream school, but this brilliant head of school understood his students and he made this adjustment for them. What he did was um, much of davening they, they all had to do together, but there were parts at the beginning and parts at the end that the children were able to opt out of. Uh -huh. and, and what he did was he gave them, he had a, a choice of four or five davening related exercises that the kids were able to do during that time. So let's say davening is 25 minutes. So he created a 10 minute, five minutes at the beginning, five minutes at the end that the children were able, I don't know what the details, I don't remember the details. Let's say they started from Yishtabach, let's say till after Shimon Esri, everybody had to do. And then certain parts they were able to opt out. The kids who opted out, they had choices. They could either write their own prayer in English. Oh, wow. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah. Sit down and compose your own prayer. Write something that you would like that's meaningful to you. Think about it. A tefillah is something that somebody else wrote a thousand years ago, right? So, so it, it, uh, I just thought it was such a brilliant idea. He, he, he had another whole packet. He showed me his stuff. I was fascinated by his creativity. Again, this was a principle of an alternative school. The kids who came to him came because they weren't keyed in. So one thing they could write their own prayer. Another choice they had was that they researched the origin of these tefillot. Who wrote them? Where did they come from? What was the historical context? Um, another one was they had a they had a, a they took tests on on the translation of the words. So again, what he did was he said, our objective is we want you to daven. We want you to feel connected to davening. And if you're not connected to a 25 minute davening, then you'll take a 15 minute davening and try one of these exercises in the hope that that will um, get you more engaged in tefillah. Mm, that's really great. That, Thank that, you. That writing the, writing the prayer was, was amazing. You know, it's interesting if you look, if you look, there's a, a tefillah, um, uh, 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 when we take out the Sefer Torah on Yomim Tevim, uh, there's a, it's called Ribbon Shel and, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a, a it's, it is in Hebrew, but it's simple Hebrew, and it's really things that we need. You know, it talks about our health and our family, and that we shouldn't need Chas Shalom to be, you know, reliant on other people, uh, on other people's gifts, and we should uh, we should merit to have long life. Simple brachas, you know, that's something that's so relatable as opposed to some of the other beautiful tefillahs. For example, about bringing karbonas in the Beis Hamikdash, is not might not be might not speak to you know, to lots of folks, a lot of children, a lot of adults, and certainly to children. So that's, that's just another way of thinking about it. You know, another, another thing that you might want to do as a family, um, and, and I know it's, it's funny, it's this time of year, you know, if, if there was one thing I was doing, I would do over as a parent, we used to take our children to, um, I, I would take our sons to Tam Cheshavis, to, you know, to the food bank to give out, to prepare, packages for needy families. And um, I, I had a remarkable experience. I didn't even connect the dots at the time. But uh, yeah, yeah. what happened was I, I would take our two boys who are Kalinahara, you know, high 30s now. And, and um, we would spend a few hours, you know, assembling the, the packages for the needy families in Muncie. And then we would go home. And I'll, ne I'll never forget it, but I forgot it at the time. I didn't attach significance. I was exhausted. We'd been doing this for three hours. And I got the kids into the car. They were probably eight, 10, 12. And okay, guys, buckle yourselves in. Let's go home already, you know? And m m one of my two boys, one of our two boys told me at the time, he said, you know, Ta, uh, we, we, we davened Mincha there. There was a... a um, 
you know, in, in middle, they stopped at whatever time it was and they had a, they daven mincha. It certainly was not a pristine shul. You know, there were forklifts around and people were running back and forth. You know, it wasn't the ideal setting to daven. And I'll never forget it. He told me, he says, you know, Ta, I davened better today than on Yom Kippur. Okay, that's what he said. He said, you know, Ta, I davened better today than on Yom Kippur. And it's, I, it was so foolish of me. It just blew right over my head. Like I said, wow, really, that's so beautiful. <laughs> you know, so it's terrible. And you know, all right, let's go home. And I don't know, it took me a couple of weeks to realize what he was saying. What he was saying is that while he was filling those, he didn't articulate it, he didn't say this to me. But my understanding was, is that when he was putting those things in the bags for those needy families, I remember him t that year, I remember him asking, he says, Ty, I mean like there are people who don't have candles and there are people who don't have enough sugar, you know, cause there were staples. And I guess that when he opened up a seder for Mincha and was davening those words about Parnasa and Baruch Eleinu Hashanah Hazas, blessed this year for us, all of a sudden became uh, uh, meaningful in a way that wasn't to him on Yom Kippur. I think that's what he was saying. So maybe as a family exercise, maybe as a family, um, you know, as a family project, maybe it would be to say, you know, you know how, and, and you can be honest with them saying, you know, how, it's hard for us to appreciate food because we all have food. Maybe we should, um, maybe next year or next week or one of these times we should go volunteer to help some of the organizations that help the needy families in our community. And you don't have to say I'm doing this so you should dive in better, but you say, well, all of us, you know, will probably develop in us a, a better appreciation. So again, it's another out of the box way of, of dealing with something that you might have a challenge with. Did, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I hope so. We'll have to see. It, exactly, exactly. Just like that. And it's a process, right? It's a process. You pick some ideas, you know, you listen to something. Look, I got this idea from the principal. I shared it with you. Uh, you know, I had an, uh, something that I picked up from my son because it was meaningful to him. And by the way, when I was, I was a school principal for over 20 years, every single year we did a charity project and a stucco project, but the kids had to, I made sure that it was designed that the children knew exactly where the money went. It didn't just go in a box. One year, for example, I'm, I'm telling you what I did as a principal. One year, we, we, um, we added cake to one week of Tom Cheshavas. Okay, the children, they, it started around uh, Shalom Mishloch Manas, instead of coming to my house. You know, one year we had like 40 pineapples. <laughs> I was a principal of the school, like hundreds of kids came and you know, it was like, so I sent an email to the families next day. I said, do me a favor, please, please don't send any shumashloch manas. I had a, I used to get dressed up. There was a box. I said, people, kids would put, put I asked the children to put in a quarter of their own money. And you know, some of the parents wrote checks, the kids gave more money, but everybody put in something and we would do something every year with it. One year we made a lending library of, uh, I'm dating myself, you know, of CDs for the, for the local hospital, um, you know, for a lending library for kids who were sick and, and weren't able to, you know, to keep them busy or occupied while they were sick. And one year, like we added cake to every box. And what we did is um, one representative from each class went uh, along and shared it with the class when they came back. So it, again, it's a creative way of getting your children keyed into what this davening thing is all about. Okay, so again, it's a process. Go for it, work on it. Hope it come, come back and share with us. Okay, question. Thank you. Sure, my greatest pleasure, sure. Um, yes, if a teen, uh, so, so one, of, um, one of the parents emailed me about, um, about a child that doesn't wanna come to the Seder and dealing with the pain and the difficulty of having a child at home who, who he or she does not want to, uh, uh, to come to the Seder at all. So I, I first of all, I, I certainly, um, you know, empathize with how painful that is as parents, you know, you put your heart and soul into this and, and to have a child that's, that's, that's not interested in participating. Um, I, I would suggest that, um, 
you give that child you give that child the opportunity to say if there's any two minutes or five minutes or any part of the seder that you would like to come for the singing uh dayenu maybe some other thing that you're doing as a family or just for the meal tell tell that child please don't feel that you're not welcome or that you don't want to participate just because you don't want to stay for the whole thing we'd love for you to come for any part that you'd like to participate in and and without making without saying anything like where were you until now if you have it usually there are parts that people find meaningful um if you're interested um mrs barkini please if you can mark this down um i'm going to send you a, a a video there was a there was a um a, a film that was a, a documentary a few years ago it was called one of us it was uh, netflix did a, a show about three uh formerly observant jews that became no longer that became no longer observant and um i actually took two clips from that movie um put it on on youtube put it on my social media and then at night i gave commentary on it and one of the one of the uh, explaining what i saw there because of my work with 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 people um with the you know no longer observed people who are no longer observant and um one of the things that that shabbos meal is absolutely fascinating that all of these folks who were not no longer religious were having a beautiful friday night meal together that they loved and they enjoyed so they didn't want the whole package but there were parts that they missed and when they interviewed one of them he said the you know do you miss this he says of course i miss this he you can hear him saying it you know of course i miss it you know so if a child doesn't want to participate in the say there i think you you the the best thing you could do uh, on so many levels is just say look sweetheart if you I, i'm certainly not going to force you to come if you don't want to but please feel free to join us for a minute five minutes any time for food for, for just to hang out with the kids just leave the invitation open so that they can participate whenever they want to and again they might or they might not um and 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 another thing that might be a, a good object uh, uh, uh to think about in terms of of a, of a goal and and try is trying to figure out why um is there a reason that they don't want to participate and try to if you do again you judge the situation if you feel that the child won't be offended by the question um then try proposing is there something that um is there some maybe frame it this way is there anything that we could do as a family that would make you feel more welcome or more willing to participate okay um uh, think about it again ask the child in other words would you rather that we don't say so many divre torah at the beginning and say some some of the torah at the meal let's say so the 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 liturgy the you know the part of this the first part of the the hagad the hagad of the say the you know the when we say it shouldn't take that long is there anything else that 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 bothers you um that would be a way to say is there something i i see you don't want to participate is there something we could do as a family to tinker with this say that that we have um not negating what we're doing as a family but could we do it in a different way that would make you more comfortable um so that might be you know that might be an option let the child come sit in the same room and sit on a couch or maybe to go take food and eat in the kitchen at least they'll be in the in the area um one final point on that uh mrs varkani vela if you can mark this down also um i i in the summer series that i did on on adolescence um one of the things that i mentioned is that when when in when people uh, are abandoning religion and this is a very very important point for all parents you know in the extreme someone that's abandoning religion completely but it, it works for diminished observance also um 
sometimes the children are, I call it ozvim et adat, where they, they're, they're abandoning religion only, meaning they enjoy their life, they're optimistic, they're happy, they, they're, they're moving forward, they have a social life, they get, they're edu being educated. Sadly, you know, Hashem religion is not part of their life right now. So I call that abandoning religion only. There's another category, that, uh, and they look, you just mark it down. I, 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 it's a longer video, but I actually pulled out two, three, four minute clips to explain this in greater detail. Um, I call it Ozvimet Achayim, people of Rahman al Stan who are abandoning life. So it sounds the same that my kid's not keeping Shabbos or my kid's not coming to the Seder. Um, there may be trauma there. There may be something very serious that that's causing this to happen. So if you see that they're unhappy and they're not in school or they're self-harming or they're doing other things like that, it's not only about religion, it's a much broader issue. And in that case, it's a social emotional piece. I think the religion gets totally put aside until your child gets whole. Um, so, so I would, um, I would encourage you, uh, you know, again, I, I got this, this message in the email. Um, I would encourage the parents who wrote that to think about which category is this? Is this something that, um, that's religion only with a happy child or is it something that, that might be trauma-based or there might be something really, really wrong that needs to be addressed? And if that's the case, I humbly tell you that that the religion at the time is just not it, it's just not the most important thing right now you have to get them whole right now okay i hope that answered your question i'll take one or two more one, a question or two more or maybe in the interest of Erev Yantav, i'll just stop now anybody have a question feel free to message or um or ask anyone else folks i'll wait another 30 seconds and then i'll wish you all good Yantav. anyone folks Okay, so I wish you Muslim bracha. I'm gonna to try to yes, get- Yes, I wanna text a question. Please go right ahead, I'll wait for it. Oh, can I speak more about kids leaving life more? Okay, so um, so I'm going to sell, like I said, I'm going to, thank you. So one of you parents asked about explaining this concept of leaving life. Um, So let me, let me elaborate a little bit more about what I, what I meant by that. Um, the, the, there are, uh, um, I'm trying to explain it in a different way. I explained it in greater detail there. I don't wanna take that much time now. I'd, I'd rather send you an email and, and, and show you some references where I did speak about it in, de in detail. Um, again, the, the, the abandoning religion are happy children who are enjoying their life, who are disconnected from religion. And that doesn't mean that there's any trauma in their life. It doesn't mean that they're unhappy. It's just not working right now, okay? Um, now, the second category is people who are abandoning life. Abandoning life means that they're not only abandoning religion, the religion is a piece of life that they're abandoning. But along with that, that they're, they're unhappy, they're miserable, they're lashing out, they're not succeeding in school, chas shalom. they're not um, happy, they might not have a, a close group of friends. Um, there may have been a divorce in the family, they may have been, a, a, you know, have lost a parent, they may be confused about different things. Um, you know, I lost my father when I was three. You know, I look back on my life and I was like thrashing around until I was 16. You know, I, I functioned, but you know, I'm sure that certainly was a big piece of it. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they're falling apart. They might have um, other issues that are annoying at them that they don't feel whole in some area. So if that's the case, then that's, that should be, um, that should be explored. That's what I'm suggesting. If there's a hole in their life, if there's a hole in their heart, if there's something that's 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 bothering them, they may have been traumatized, the chas some sort of abuse. They may they they may be 
maybe they're being bullied in school and they're unhappy. Maybe there are other circumstances at home that are making them unhappy. Um, so if any of those things, if, think of it this way, if they're not whole yet, then before you're gonna talk about benching or davening or sitting at the say there, if a child is lashing and thrashing out and, and not happy, in all likelihood, but you're not gonna be successful. You're much more, you're much better off trying to devote your energy to trying to make them whole. That's basically what I said. I'll send you some emails. What to do with kids struggling? Um, okay, so great question. So again, what happens if you have a child that, that that's semi-observant at the time? Let's say they're in their, they're, they're one of the parents. I, I, got, a, I got another email uh, uh, along those lines where you have a child who's, who's let's say, up in the room, uh, either on the phone or, or whatever. And, you know, should you call them down for the next course um, or let them come down whenever they want to? It's probably best if you ask them. Why don't you ask the child, look, I don't want to come across as nudging you. Um, we're serving, I really made some great food. I worked very hard on it. Uh, or mom worked very hard on it. Or we both worked very hard on it. Um, would you like me to call you when, when we serve a new course so that you don't feel any pressure? Give them a choice. Give them a choice directly. Look, we would love for you. The big overall message is we would love to you to we would love for you to participate as much as you can. And you're welcome to come for any part that you would like to. That's that's what I think, you know, that's what I think the message should be. And um whether or not you how you how you guide them then you know you might want to have um i i think you should ask the children the, the question i got a text there am i enabling that oh just one moment please i'm trying to deal with the trauma mm, okay so uh, i don't think it's enabling. i think it's enabling. i think it empowers them to be able to participate as much as they want to um i'll close just with one with one thought you know one of the more powerful um experiences in in my years of dealing with teenagers um, my wife and i have been volunteering uh, the last nine years the last year we didn't because of covid but we've been volunteering to spend uh rosh hashanah Yom kippur uh with with kids in recovery uh with kids who are recovery for addiction and um Many of these kids were, they came to a Yom Kippur program, it was Madrego, so it was an organization that does fantastic work with, with, with their population. So they obviously came because they wanted to participate in some way, but they were mostly, many or most of them were hanging out outside. Um, so, and I, I, speaking specifically to the, this particular question, so in, in middle, about halfway through Ni'ila, I get a tap on my shoulder and it's one of the kids. Uh, they, they, they actually have a really nice uh, setup there by Rosh Hashanah. Um, all staff families, like I'm, we're volunteers, you know, so my wife and I. So um, we have a, a table, let's say there's, we're there with five people all together. So this table's for 12. So we put up a number seven, means we have seven empty seats and, and kids rotate in for different meals. So you get to spend time with the kids there. Um, so this young man had spent time at our at our Rosh Hashanah table uh, one or two years previously. So again, this kid was in really bad shape in recovery. And um, so he walks over, taps, that's the backstory. So he taps me on the shoulder in the middle of Ne'ila. And he says, Rebbe, do you think I belong here? So I said, of course, why not? So he says, tell me, I, I said, what are you thinking? So this is a quote, this is what he told me. He says, Rebbe, I'm hanging outside with my friends and um, I told one of them that, you know, the sun is setting. Yom Kippur, excuse me, I'm gonna try not to lose it. Um, Yom Kippur is almost over. I, I'd like to go inside. I feel like I should go in and, and dive in a little. So this is this young man who told me, he's speaking himself. I says, I told this to my friends. So one of my friends said, <laughs> the kid tells me this, he says, one of my friends told me, well, if I was God, I would kick you out. I'm not going to finish the sentence that he used. Um, he used some rather flowery language. He says, if I was God, I would kick you out and explained exactly how he would kick him out. 
because he says, where were you until now? All day long, he says, Rebbe, you saw, I was outside smoking and sitting in a car and eating all the kipper. Now, all of a sudden, a half hour to, you know, and a, the, a half hour to, to, to the end of the evening, now I show up. So he says, who's right? He said, I said, I'll come in and ask you and I'll, I'll, I'll listen to whatever you say. So that was his question to me. Do I belong here? I wasn't here all day, which is similar to what you're asking about the Seder, really. It's just, you know, the same concept. So he said, Rebbe, tell me the truth. So like I always do when these things come along and I would encourage parents to do this. If you don't know what to say, <laughs> God do me a solid. You know, I ask Hashem, please help me. I don't know what to say. So Hashem threw a thought in my mind and I told him our, our youngest daughter, she's she married now, she was a teenager then. So I told him, I said, you know, we have whatever, 16 year old daughter. I said, in our family, when this is what I told the kid in Milanila, so I said, you know, in our family, when the kids go to sleep, we give them a kiss, they come down to us, we go up to the room, we just kiss them, I love you, good night. So I said, what happens? I have a teenage daughter. How about if we had some words? Maybe we had some quarreling that was going, you know, she and I got into a little a scuffle and she doesn't want to kiss me good night. So I said, well, would I want her to come to my window and just wave? Or would I rather she don't do anything? If you don't want to kiss me goodnight, then just, I don't care. So I, t I told this kid, I said, look, you'll get through your trauma and Mirza Hashem, you'll have a family. Uh, actually, this guy had, Baruch Hashem has two kids already. So I said, you'll have a family and Mirza Hashem, you'll see parents take what parents can get. That's what I told him. I said, if my daughter said that she's not ready to, to give me a goodnight kiss, uh, I'll, take a, I'll take a wave at the window, bet it over nothing any day of the week. So I told him, I said, I don't know what Hashem's thinking, but I imagine Hashem would be very happy to hear from you, even if you just come in and wave for a few minutes. Um, and he, he liked the answer and he opened up, a, uh, I gave him my machzer, I gave him my seder, and we, we shared a shtender for the rest of Nila. So that was my response to him. So I'm saying that's what, that was my message to him that, that Hashem does want you to participate and we do want you here. So participate, forget the friends that are telling you that God would throw you out. That's not what a parent does. So um, again, I, I, I hope you find the thought helpful. It is challenging with the other children, seeing that the kids running back and forth with them. The kids know what's going on. You might want to, if they ask you something, you might want to say, look, this is very difficult for us also, as you can imagine. But Yitzi or Rifki, they're part of our family. We love them. If you needed any, anything special, we would gladly do it for you. And, and you know, we're, we're glad to, 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 to do it for him or her. So, you know, rather than make that child, uh, um, you know, like they're doing something wrong, quite to the contrary, bring them in and explain to the children that you're a family and you do this together. Um, I, th I really think it's the nicest thing. It's the nicest thing you could say. I just posted on social media recently um, and I'll close with this. Um, my wife and I were a, at, a, at a retreat in Boca Raton a few, a few winters ago. There's a wonderful Chabad Shliach who has a recovery um, program. And he, he invited us to come to, you know, to be on staff for Shabbos. Um, and Friday night, we, we were just walking around to the tables, my wife and I being hospitable and saying hello to people. Obviously at these events, you don't ask anyone who they're with or if they're in recovery, you just, hello, how are you? My name is Yankee, you know, that's it. I mean, you don't pry, you don't ask anything. But it was quite striking as we were walking around the dining room, there was a very large table with a, an extended Hasidic family. Uh, there were parents my age, you know, the grandparents. There were two or three married kids with grandchildren. And there was one kid at the table who was visibly not observant at the time. Now, of course, we didn't say a thing, but when my wife walked by, one of the, one of the daughters or daughters-in-law of, you know, the age of our children came up, came up to us and she said, we never said a word, but she said, you know, you're probably wondering like what, you're probably wondering like <laughs> what all of us are doing here. She says, we're not all addicted. That's what she said. She says, we're not all in recovery. Cause it was, it was striking because people usually come one or two people together. You know, some people come with a spouse or with a parent, but usually people come themselves 
from recovery. It was just jarring to see a family of Kneinahara, you know, 18, 20, 22 people. So she said, Mambrider, she said in Yiddish, she says, Mambrider is do. She pointed to the brother. She said, my brother is here. My brother's in recovery. He's in recovery for addiction. And she said it so to, I'm speaking specifically to the mom who asked what I should tell my other kids when they complained that, that their sibling is running back and forth to their room. I, I think this is the nicest thing you could tell them. So this woman said, she said, we're a family. Families stick together. Our brother is here. We're here. So none of them needed to be there for Shabbos. They came to support him. What a beautiful message that was to, to this child that his family went outside their comfort zone for him. So I think that's the nicest thing we can tell our kids who are struggling. If the siblings ask us what's going on, I think it's a beautiful answer. We're a mishpacha, we're a family. This is what we do. We hang together. And if someone's hurting in the family, we're, 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 we're all in together. In fact, it, it says, um, there are some sukkum that support this, that as you know, as if we could understand that Hashem goes to Golis, went to Golis when we did. Now, however, we, we understand that. Um, so we have this concept to just say, look, I think the nicest thing you could say is we're a family and we stick together and whatever anybody, anybody needs tolerance from us, that's what we do because we're a family. Okay, guys, have a beautiful Yantif, everyone. Um, I have your emails, but so I hope as Hashem, I'd like to carve out some time every week or two to be able to do this. Um, you know, I'll, I'll send out a survey, um, getting your your take on on if and how often and what you'd like, whether it should be an open format or whether we should, um, you know, collect questions and send an agenda during the week. I'm, I'm certainly open to doing it any way that's helpful for you guys as parents. Okay, so uh, have a wonderful Yantif, everyone. I hope uh, you enjoy it to the fullest extent and um, best wishes uh, for Nachas from your children. Okay, be well, everyone. Thank you, Yantif.